big button. So I was asked to talk about um, autonomic dysfunction Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and, and by prefacing, I, I will say that I was specifically told not to talk about treatment because other people will be talking about treatment. Um, now, one of the challenges is that um, I hate the diagnosis of dysautonomia. If someone comes to the clinic and they, you know, they have various diagnoses, and dysautonomia is one of them, I, I want to pull what little hair I have out. And the reason isn't because uh, there's, it's not that there's nothing wrong with the patient necessarily, but it's not a proper diagnosis, right? It's, a, it's sort of a, an umbrella term that's a collection of things. And I would argue it's a little like saying someone has heart disease. So I'm a cardiologist by training. I, I work in, the, in a cardiovascular institute. I think it's fair to say that pretty much everyone that comes to the institute, to the clinic, has, probably has some form of heart disease. But, but heart disease, has a bunch of different things. You know, I'm an arrhythmia guy by training. We deal with, you know, fast, slow, abnormal heart rhythms. People can have valve disease. People can have coronary artery disease that cause heart attacks, what we think of as heart attacks. And people can have congenital heart disease. And within that, there are a bunch of individual diagnoses. And the relevance of this is that the prognosis and the treatment varies for each of these diagnoses, right? So as a, as a label, heart disease is correct it's just useless, right? And I would argue that dysautonomic or autonomic dysfunction can be thought of similarly. And this list isn't meant to be comprehensive, but there's sort of stuff that we classify under POTS or postural tachycardia syndrome. There are patients with autonomic failure, which is a very, very different phenomenon, uh, at least to the cardiovascular forms. Um, vasovagal syncope is very common. Some would consider it a form of dysautonomia, some might not. And there are some congenital disorders that are rare, but again, have specific mechanistic issues. So I've changed the title of the talk that Laura assigned. And what I'm going to focus on, because I think this is what they wanted, was to discuss this overlap with postural tachycardia syndrome um, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So the term postural tachycardia syndrome is relatively young. The definition that we use today largely was developed by Philip Lowe and Ron Schondorf and published 25 years ago. It's an anniversary of sorts. I'm not good with my colors. Is this silver? It's, it's one of them. It's the 25-year one. And it really requires a couple of things. It's a recognition that there are patients that feel unwell, and they feel unwell with specific hemodynamic characteristics. And those characteristics are an excessive orthostatic tachycardia. When they stand up, their heart rate goes up more than it should. That's important. It's important to recognize that the heart rate should go up when you stand up. The problem isn't the heart rate goes up. The problem is that these patients are overachievers, right? They do it much better than they should. In terms of the, the criteria used, and, and this is itself a bit problematic, we've traditionally used a heart rate increase of over 30. And this really comes from no other reason than when they did a study of their, in their tilt lab at Mayo, they sort of looked and said, this is the average increase in heart rate with tilt, and this was two standard deviations above it. So statistically, this is abnormal. And that's how they came up with that 30 beat criteria. But then when they went back, they realized that orthostatic tachycardia has a physiologic change with age. So young people, kids, will have much higher increases in their heart rate than when they're perfectly well. A 30 beat increase in a 10 year old means nothing. A 30-beat increase in a 50-year-old is much more impressive than a 30-beat increase in a 20-year-old. But yet we have set criteria, but because of this dramatic change in kids, um, another group at Mayo actually went and, and studied this in schools and then came back and suggested we redefine the criteria in adolescence that require at least a 40-beat increase. And it's even more problematic in kids younger than that because we don't have a set number, but recognizing we can't live on the number. The other part of this that's important is that this isn't a disorder of hypotension. It may be in the spectrum, but this tachycardia is in the absence of a drop in blood pressure when people stand up. If they have a drop in blood pressure every time they get tachycardic, it's not that they don't have anything. They have a disorder we call orthostatic hypotension that's been recognized for, for much, much longer. And I guess the most important part of this is what I've described up to now isn't POTS. What I've described is POT. Not the marijuana kind, which is, by the way, legal, I think, uh, you know, another few, maybe now in Canada. It's coming. Um, sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't plugging the marijuana, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, what I've described is physiology, 
right? We've described, you know, an excessive heart rate change, but the S in POTS is a means it's a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms that say, you know, this group looks like this other group, right? So these patients have to be symptomatic, and they have to have symptoms that are sort of typical or characteristics. And the keys to POTS are that the tachycardia, the symptoms associated with the tachycardia, like palpitation and lightheadedness, we'll go through that in another slide, tend to be worse with upright posture when you're standing, for example, maybe even when seated compared to lying down, and then tend to get better when you lie down. Not all of them, but often the dominant ones. And finally, this has to be a chronic disorder, right? I'm sure we don't have to quibble over chronic with you, but the reason this criteria is there is that if you reach out to your healthy friends and get them to do a science experiment. So next time, next winter, when they get a bad cold or a flu, get them to measure their orthostatic vitals, you know, when they feel like puking the next day, right? And they will likely have an orthostatic tachycardia, and they may have a lot of these symptoms. Some of this is actually a physiologic adaptation by the autonomic nervous system to being ill. The difference is, in your friend, it'll last a day or two, and then it'll go away. Right? And the patients we're talking about, this isn't an acute phenomenon. They got sick in different ways, but then it just didn't go away. It's, so it has to be a chronic disorder as well. And obviously, this is in the absence of another clear underlying cause for the tachycardia. If, I, if you knew that someone just had a major GI bleed, for example, and had lost a lot of the blood volume and they were tachycardic, that's not POTS, that's a GI bleed. So this slide, I'm not going to read through all of them, but it just breaks down some of the symptoms, some of which I imagine are recognizable to, to many of you, um, into cardiac and non-cardiac. And, and the beauty of the world of medicine is you can break things up in different ways. Um, you know, the famous line is there are two groups of people in the world, people that divide the world into two groups and people that don't. Um, you know, but as a cardiologist, there, there are a bunch of symptoms on the left that I think we can relate to the cardiovascular system more easily. But there are a bunch of other symptoms that, that are harder to relate. And, and some of these are the more disabling symptoms, quite frankly, in many of our patients. The mental clouding or brain fog um, can be disabling. Headaches, very common. I'd say 90, 95% have some form or another. Um, nausea, men, much of which can be worse when upright, and tremulousness. The symptoms on the top in black on both sides are ones that often get worse in this patient population with upright posture. But there are symptoms on the bottom that aren't necessarily postural, the exercise intolerance, fatigue. I, I say close to everyone is chronically fatigued, which is different than saying everyone meets the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, but, but chronic fatigue is, is universal, and sleep complaints are, are incredibly common. This is a tilt table um, test of a control subject on the left and the POTS patient on the right. Heart rate channels on top, blood pressures in the middle, and. On the bottom, we have a tilt angle sensor, so you can tell when the table went up and the table went down. What I want you to focus on is if you look at the uh, heart rate in the, in the control subject on the left, it does go up. Remember, orthostatic tachycardia is not abnormal. But if you look at the patient on the right, there are two things to note. The first, if you look at the blood pressure, is that on average, the blood pressure is not different in the POTS patient than the control subject. I think you could look at this and say, but it looks different, right? I think the POTS patient blood pressure sort of looks like I do when I've woken up and in need of a haircut, right? It's sort of spiky and all over the place. But the average pressure is not different. It's not a disorder primarily of a blood pressure being too high or too low. And if you look at the heart rate, the heart rate goes up as well, but a lot, right? So in this patient, we went until she told us to put the table down because she felt horrible. And at that time, her heart rate was 180 beats a minute. And all we'd done is tilt her up and wait. And like I said, symptoms are important. So in this study, we were rating symptoms, uh, just a series of symptoms on a 0 to 10 scale every few minutes. And you can see that the healthy control subjects, grad students at Vanderbilt, um, for the most part were asymptomatic until they get a mild symptom, then you see the symptom drops off. That's because they sort of get symptomatic, feel like they're going to faint, and then faint. And then we drop them out of the data collection. <laughs> the POTS patients, on the other hand, you know, almost immediately, within the first couple of minutes, would tell me how they're just about to faint. 
and they keep telling me for the full 30 minutes of the tilt. Right? The important thing to recognize here is that fundamentally POTS is a disorder where people feel faint or feel like fainting, but not necessarily a disorder of fainting. That's not to say some patients can't also faint, but it's actually a minority of POTS patients that have syncope or fainting, like full syncope. But almost all of them feel like they're going to faint. So we'll show a little bit of sort of other physiologic data, but one of the things that we did over the last couple of years um, is try and get a sense of the challenges that POTS patients face. And this was done in conjunction with Lauren Stiles from Dysautonomy International. And this was a fairly large Vanderbilt ethics approved patient survey. Um, so we launched this a few years ago. We actually have looked at the data more recently. This data cut's a couple of years old. But even in that window of a little over a year, we had over 4,000 patients who told us they had a physician diagnosis of POTS. Overwhelmingly, well over 90, 95% of the patients were female, which actually does probably reflect you know, what we saw in studies, thought there was a bias. Interestingly, and without as good an explanation, well over 90% of the patients were Caucasian. Again, I don't know if this is a, a bias of ascertainment or if this is real. We saw that we see this in our sort of studies coming out of the tertiary care centers, but there we could write it off to lack of access to healthcare insurance, but this is an online survey, so this may actually reflect true biology. We looked at when the symptoms started, and in about half our patients, or a little less than half our patients, well, a, a good bulk of our patients started around puberty, give or take, right? More than half the patients started under the age of 18, but it wasn't all of that, right? There's a, a sort of a sporadic nature, which may reflect different underlying reasons for patients developing their POTS. And we had a laundry list of symptoms that we asked people to say yes or no to whether they had, and some of the leaders in the clubhouse are listed here. So some of the stuff is what you'd expect clearly related to high heart rates, lightheadedness, tachycardia, um, feeling like you're on the verge of fainting. But other symptoms that over 90% of the patients reported were headaches, were difficulty concentrating, nausea almost 90% had, memory problems was a big problem, stomach pains in over 80%. Right? So this clearly reflects the systemic involvement, um, as many of you would, would uh, be able to confirm. We asked about education, right? So a lot of these patients developed this well below the age of 18, and certainly in, in a time when they're still in school. Almost 90% had missed some school because of their POTS. 30% uh, were homeschooled, presumably on medical grounds, not religious grounds, but we're not sure. 25% had dropped out of school, right? And the challenge here is that it's not just a matter of being sick for a year and, you know, missing work or missing a bit of time, but this is an age, this decade, sort of, you know, arguably from 15 to 25 is where, uh, to a great extent, we determine the path of the course of the rest of our lives in terms of the education and other choices that we make. And these illnesses, this illness is getting in the way of that, and, and is, this is potentially a major problem if we don't fix that can have repercussions for decades. So, one challenge that you may have come across is the question as to what the overlay is with um, psychiatric disorders. So a lot of our patients come across as very anxious and they've been dismissed. And so at one point several years ago, we actually did a study at Vanderbilt to assess this formally. And it was led by uh, my wife when she was a research fellow before her psychiatry training. And there was you know, a structured evaluation to see if anything mapped to DSM-4TR criteria at the time, so the diagnostic manual and a bunch of psychometric tests. And the one thing that came out positive was that POTS patients had more inattention, right? So this Connor scale is an ADHD tool. Um, and you can see compared to both the background population, general population, and the psychiatrically normal population, which this is an uber normal population. My wife proudly stated I would not have qualified for this. Uh, the POTS patients actually had a higher level of inattention, not as much as ADHD, but, but significantly more than normal, right? And this may play a role in sort of starting to understand the, the memory problems that are described. It may uh, 
be memory to some extent, but it may be attention or inability to process the memory that's the bigger problem. But ultimately, there was not a higher incidence of major depression or anxiety disorders, nor of panic disorder compared to the general population. Right, so I think the conclusion is that while some patients may be crazy, they weren't DSM-4TR crazy. <laughs> what about quality of life? So this is not our data. This is published data using the SF36, a widely used generic quality of life tool, looking at back pain and patients on dialysis. And these are, these are disorders that are viewed as having a crappy quality of life generally. This is the data from our POTS patients overlaid on that. Right, so this is self-reported as all of these tools are. The exact reason for the poor quality of life, this doesn't get into, but, but clearly there's a major problem here. So why do these patients have POTS? And I think the, the, the key message, take home message is that POTS isn't a thing. POTS is a collection of things, right? It's a syndrome and there are different disease processes that get you there. And this is a quote from David Robertson, my mentor at Vanderbilt, who led a lot of this work. When studying the pathophysiology of, of POTS, uh, you know, the challenge relates to the, the old parable of the blind man and the elephant. Do you guys know this story? Yeah, so it's, it's a classic. It's, you know, it's from the Indian subcontinent. Every group there has a version of this. This is the Hindu version. And like most great Indian things, it was uh, stolen by a Brit, and he took credit for it. Um, it's not in the London Museum, though. <laughs> so the story is it was six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. They each, by observation, may satisfy his mind. They conclude that the elephant is like a wall, a snake, a spear, a tree, a fan, or a rope, depending on what they touch. And that's really a big part of the problem in the POTS research, is that there are different investigators studying different bits and we find different things and the challenge is putting it all together. So I, I, I'm not going to go into detail on, on any of these. These are sort of a lot of the pathophysiologies that are thrown around and being investigated. There's clearly a subgroup with mast cell activation. Understanding the relation is, is an area of interest and in work. Um, there are some patients that have been described as having partial autonomic neuropathies and there's a lot of interest now in small fiber neuropathies and the role of that's not clear. We did a lot of work on blood volume regulation and a lot of patients, not all, but the majority of patients when we study them formally have low blood volume. And so there may be a problem with the part of the argument for the salt and stuff like that. Um, patients, about 40 to 50% are hyperadrenergic. They have a revved up sympathetic nervous system. Again, that could be primary or secondary and due to different mechanisms. And there's a lot of interest now in the last few years in the role of autoantibodies and autoimmunity and, and the role that plays. The truth is, right now, we don't know the answers to that, but there's a lot of, a lot of interest in that. So the, for the final bit before um, I get pulled off with a cane, um, the question was, how does this relate to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? You know, there's a, in the POTS survey that I alluded to briefly before, a more recent analysis we've done is to try and look at sort of the presentation differences in different subgroups. And, in our cohort, about 25% of patients self-describe as having Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So this is the universe of POTS and 25 of Ehlers-Danlos. I imagine if we went the other way, we'd get a, a, a different number, but there's clearly an overlap. I'm not gonna show you other data from this, because we're still working on that from our survey, but there is you know, some smoke around this published in the last decade or so. This study was from Israel, where they studied uh, almost 50 patients with um, joint hypermobility syndrome. I won't even try to tell you I understand sort of the history of this and the framework. Alan went through this in great detail yesterday, but in 2003, give him a break, it seemed reasonable to, to use and, and may represent some, some of you in this room. Um, so 78% of this group actually had orthostatic intolerance complaints with reduced standing times compared to the healthy individuals, right? So they weren't able to stand as much they had numerous symptoms which look a lot like the symptoms that I listed for the POTS patients. They actually did drug testing and they showed that um, there seemed to be a lower amount of isoproteranol, a beta receptor agonist that required to raise the heart rate. So beta receptor sensitivity, hypersensitivity is one of the mechanisms that have been thrown around for POTS. Similarly, there may be alpha receptor issues. So these are cardiovascular 
receptors that adrenaline and noradrenaline work on, right? So the details of this are probably less important than there seemed to be something there. We need to better understand, it's worth better understanding it. And then there's a, sort of a more recent study um, out of Ghent where they looked at sort of a bigger EDS cohort um, with sort of a bunch of autonomic symptom tools and quality of life scales. And compared to control subjects, the patients with hypermobile, the hypermobile form of EDS, had more symptoms. If your vision is better than mine, you can read what exactly the symptoms are, but I think the key take home from this is pretty much whatever the symptom was, there was a higher rate. The really high peak is actually for the orthostatic intolerance of lightheadedness. And then there's a lower sort of grumbling peak for issues around GI-related uh, symptoms. And interestingly, they looked at hypermobile versus, you know, the, uh, the CEDS group, the classic group, and the hypermobile group actually had more of these symptoms than the classic EDS group as well. And this slide just sort of, you know, numerically confirms that in different ways of assessing orthostatic tolerance, the hypermobile group is worse than the controls. So there's tachycardia, and there's symptoms, and this actually affects your ability to stand for any length of time. Confirm with tilt. So this was probably the money question, and, and I'm going to disappoint you because I don't know the answer, and that is, well, why does this happen? And the truth is no one knows, and if anyone tells you they know, they're lying, because the data is really not out there right now. There are theories, but the data is not out there. So the, the hand-wavy explanation as well, we know that there seems to be a connective tissue problem in patients with EDS, and you know, one can imagine how if this also occurred in the aorta or the vasculature in the hypermobile patients, you know, as well as in the uh, vascular or classic patients, this could alter vascular compliance, you get more blood pooling, you get less recoil. It's an interesting hypothesis. I know there's a bit of work trying to use tools to try and measure this, but to this point, that hasn't been shown to actually that that is the mechanism. Another hypothesis thrown out is that there's a physical activity that's secondary to all the other issues, right? So there are lots of orthopedic issues that fundamentally limit the ability to be active, and there's a deconditioning that sets in. Don't know if that's true in the EDS population per se, but certainly in the patients I see with POTS, even if that's not the primary cause, many of these patients were athletes and runners before they got sick, but after you get sick, there's no doubt that they're not able to function at the same level, at least initially. And exercise training is actually a fairly important portion of the POTS reconditioning program, um, although not easy to do. And then uh, the question is, does a peripheral neuropathy or small fiber neuropathy play a role? And again, this is an area of, of interest, an area of study. Um, I know Disautonomy International is interested in trying to fund some work in this, in this space, but still underdeveloped. But the short answer right now is we don't know why these autonomic problems or POTS-like problems develop in, these, in, in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And uh, if anyone has another moonshot-type grant that you want to give to Laura, I'm happy to, to help sort that out. <laughs> so the take-home message is POTS is a chronic disorder that's associated with significant disability, but it's not a disease, it's a syndrome. Right? It's not one thing, there are actually multiple things or lots of things in there. So you have to be careful in extrapolating too much from one person to another because there may be different mechanisms at play. And ultimately, the issues around orthostatic intolerance and EDS are really primarily seen in the hypermobile group. It's more common, you know, as one might expect, but has now been shown than either in a healthy control population or even in other EDS subgroups. In this case, it was compared to the classic um, EDS group. But to date, the mechanisms are uncertain. Thank you for your time. <laughs>